honored to be on the platform of the Ambedkar Penya Study Circle. Um, I, since you've just heard Viju Krishnan a few days ago, I don't. I'm, I want to try and not replicate or duplicate things that were said. But before I begin on my topic, I do want to take up something on what, uh, from where Libin made the point about the propaganda of rich farmers. This morning, the Indian Express has an op-ed by the redoubtable uh, Surjit Balla, amplifying on that propaganda, saying, who, uh, by the way, Mr. Professor Balla is India's representative at the IMF, fittingly. Uh, and Mr. Balla said, uh, Professor Balla says, you know, this is socialism for rich farmers, what they want, what these guys are demanding. Let's look at who is rich and how rich farmers are in this country. What is the income of a farmer? We do not have individual data of income of individual farmers. That data we don't have. What we do have is household income of farmers. The last and the latest study was 2013, the NSS 70th round on the situation in agriculture and farm households. What did the average farm household in India earn? By the way, later data, there isn't any. The major studies, the serious ones, those have either not taken place or they have been, their data have been suppressed by the NDA government. Uh, like the consumption expenditure survey of the national sample survey, crushed by the NDA government on the ground that there is some problem, questions about the quality of the data. Yeah. So we have to look at the 2013 national sample survey uh, data to know what a farm household earns. And a household, by the way, is generally in rural India, you would treat it as five people on average, maybe 4.5 to 5, you'd get that figure. But your household of five, the average income in this country for farmers, for farm households, was 6,426 rupees or per capita less than 1300 rupees a month. These are your rich farmers. Now there are ultra rich farmers, they're corporate farmers. They are maybe Sharad Pawars and people like that. Yep. They're not the ones at the gates of Delhi. Now this rich farmer, let's go a little further in this. This 6,426 rupees is not what they earn from agriculture but what they earn from all sources, including agriculture, okay. including agriculture. Agriculture makes up about 62% of that amount. So actual amount from agriculture is even less than 6,426 rupees, which by the way is equal to some 80, $85 US. Household of five. Now this, uh, this 6,426 includes 62% from agriculture and the rest from other sources, non-farm activity, off-farm activity, meaning wage labor, remittances, all this sort of stuff gets included in that and it comes to 6,426 rupees. Many of you have an understanding of how a farm works and survives in India the old man, father, or the eldest son remains on the farm and runs the farm. Women are, of course, in our society excluded from that ownership. 
but that on and three brothers or two brothers go off they go somewhere else maybe one goes and teaches in a primary school as a teacher in the next district maybe if it's varanasi up one of them comes to mumbai where he runs a uh, where he drives a taxi everybody sends remittances to the farm and at harvest time they claim their share of the produce that's how very large that's how millions of farms in this country function because we destroyed consciously by policy by design by desire we destroyed the viability of farming creating a crisis that is moving us towards handing over agriculture to corporations so here's your agrarian crisis in five words the corporate hijack of agriculture the process by which that is achieved five words predatory commercialization of the countryside and the outcome of that in five words greatest displacement in our history so come back to the rich farmer as i said that 6426 we'll revisit that crisis but coming back to the rich farmers you know that 6426 rupees is an average it's an average between punjab and kerala on the one hand where that monthly income would be much higher um and odisha and we western odisha and chatisgarh where it would be less than half of that average putting these diverse figures together you get that average of 6426 even it is not i mean even if it was double in the punjab what are we saying we are saying 12 to 13000 rupees between five people per month one of the we just published a story 20 minutes ago from one of the farmers there and it shows you something of the resolve of people he can't walk because he was repairing something at his house when he fell from the roof two years ago he owns four acres at jit singh he has broken his hip bone completely and has slight fracture in the spine but he still came there all the way in a trolley you know the tractor and trucks have these trolleys 250 kilometers from fatehpur sahib district in acute pain he arrives there and he tells us my pain is not greater than those of the others who are here fighting these are your rich farmers his annual income he's a rich farmer the correct term for the farmers of punjab and maybe haryana maybe the correct term for that is less worse off relatively less worse off he was earning from his four acres 2 lakh 50000 a 2 lakh 50000 a year after he broke his hip yeah he has leased out the land and the rental he gets is just is 50000 rupees less than that now he is very typical of the kind of farmers who are around there at the gates if you want to think that those earnings are make him a rich person be my guest let's look at what this inequality thing is about let's look at the inequality part of it firstly all the battles firstly agrarian or other crises all these are tied to india's structural crisis of inequality it is an and in india it's not even inequality it is inequalities in plural inequalities of economics of class of caste of gender and it's astonishing how 
the then the social inequalities in india replicate themselves in these gender and economic inequalities as well themselves there and they show up it's not an accident it's not an accident that the constitution of this country begins with its preamble and again in the directive principles what does it say justice for all justice social economic and political the framers of your constitution i think consciously place that word social first right so in fact i think the greatest speech ever made on inequality in this country and the greatest prophecy if not speech was made by baba saheb ambedkar on november 25th 1949 when handing over the draft constitution to the constituent assembly ambedkar said today we enter a world of contradictions yeah in politics we have democracy in society and economy there is no democracy the tension between the lack of economy in society and economy and the democracy in politics the tension between these will one day explode this fine constant the fine political democracy you have built i'm paraphrasing him but that's what he said yeah true words when i was spoke that's exactly the situation you face today what there was by way of political electoral democracy is going up in smoke as a result of accentuated exacerbated inequalities driven by policy driven by desire for the last many decades but particularly from 1991 onwards when you put your foot on the accelerator pedal let's have a look at some of these inequalities i also want to say that whatever we are talking about the struggles we are talking about can only be resolved through a framework of justice a framework ambedkar helped embed in the indian constitution and in so many of our laws not through charity or inclusive development not based on the goodwill or presumed conscience or willingness to compromise of the elites but through struggles for that justice a look at your countryside the latest we know from papers in food policy journal elsewhere three out of four rural indians cannot afford a nutritious diet three out of four rural indians means 527 million human beings three out of four rural indians cannot afford a nutritious diet according to a paper recently published in the journal food policy as late as october this year now even if they spent all their income of this 63% of 520 527 million indians they would not be able to afford a nutritious diet even if they spent every rupee every paisa of their income on food even if they spent every paisa of their income on food nothing else nothing on clothing nothing on rent nothing on uh, um electricity nothing on education nothing on health nothing on the upbringing of their children just 100% if they spent it on food 527 million indians rural indians still cannot afford a nutritious diet now let's be reasonable we know that non food items are a very major cost in the lives of all indians but let's be conservative and say what what if all these indians spent one third these rural indians if they spent one third of their income on uh, non food expenses on health on education transportation if they spent one third of their income 
then 76% of rural Indians, if they spend one third of their income on non-food expenses, then 76% or 635 million rural Indians cannot afford a nutritious diet. At the same time that we are coming out with these figures, we get the information that the wealth of Indian billionaires increased by 34% in just four to five months of the pandemic. You know, the great, remember that people were writing that this is a great leveler, pandemic is a great, it isn't. It affects poor people, marginalized people, struggling people, hungry people, a lot worse than it affects the middle and upper classes. Just imagine that the wealth of the wealth of the Indian billionaires, which is there's about 115, 120 of them, went up to 423 billion in these few months. And that is, you know, their net cumulative net asset worth. That's an increase of 35%. In the same period, Mr. Mukesh Ambani, the richest Indian went from being the 19th richest person in the world to the fifth richest person or fourth. That's some debate, exotic, I mean, some exotic debate over that, whether it is fourth or fifth, I won't get into it. Over this period, when they increased their wealth by 35%, 120 people, output has contracted by almost a quarter and so has employment. That's one set of indicators you can take for your inequalities. Now, when I gave you those figures on hunger, let's break them down further. That 76%, the 65.3%. Is it equal? Is it a level playing field? No. Is it across all Indian children? No. It is across the majority of Indian children. However, the prevalence of anemia and malnourishment, anemia and malnutrition is much higher, much higher among Dalit children and Adivasi children. It is not the same. And that data you can see in the National Family Health Survey, number four, which was conducted in 2015-16 and this data you got in 2008. Let's look at the national figures, and then let's look at the children of Dalit, Dalit children and Adivasi. Nationally, the figures were 38.5%, 38.5% of all children under the age of five suffer from stunting. Yeah, that is um, low height for age and weight, low, low height for age, 21% of all Indian children suffer from wasting, which means that they are too thin for their height. And 36% are underweight or thin for their age. So the percentage 38 is for all children under five who suffer stunting. For Adivasis, that is 43.8%. For Dalits, it's 42.8%. 43.8 and 42.8%. Now, in, if you take wasting, child wasting, it is 21% national figure, 27.4% for Adivasi children, and 21.2% for Dalit children. If you take underweight, 36% for all children, 45.3% for Adivasis, 39.1% for Dalits. And here's one little slate of hand. That national figure includes Dalits and Adivasis. If you remove Dalit and Adivasi children from there, then the non-Dalit, non-Adivasi sections of India improve dramatically. Their numbers would improve 
because right now they are they are also averaging on these numbers being included now look at that kind of hunger that kind of hunger and as all of you know the indian population has not been hungrier in 50 years because of the pandemic the loss of employment the loss of income the loss of purchasing power the loss of jobs and um, and yet and yet if and yet this country has had in august 104 million tons of food grain piled up in buffer stocks which you needed to distribute without reserve that's what you saved it for for a crisis that's what it was meant to be there for for a crisis it was also meant to be there to moderate the market price instead it's being used to shore up the market price and that 104 million ton what are they planning on doing with it export you're going to export grain when your people are starving they did this in 2002 as well and the same mr shantaram whose report is being bandied about i mean completely moronical report the same shantaram was then food and agriculture minister in 2002 when they exported millions of tons of the cheaper varieties of grain while there was huge hunger at home and the kind of problems that came up reflected in the 2004 election but you would ask me you would ask me why who would buy we exported it to the west who in the west would buy the cheaper qualities of food grain which our poor people would eat very legitimate question we weren't exporting it for human beings we were exporting it for the consumption of western livestock the cows and the, the cattle of europe and united states for them they were buying it because it was poor quality low quality it was extremely cheap which meant that we were selling it exporting it at prices lower than that with than that at which we sold it to our own poor people now again we you know so that that's one in april this year the cabinet of the union government the union cabinet passed a gr permitting without cap without capping figures permitting the conversion of any number of millions of tons of rice into ethanol to make hand sanitizers okay to make hand sanitizers people are starving and you're destroying rice stocks it is rice by the way for that uh, for ethanol to make hand sanitizer now again all migrants are not the same you know why there are migrations every one of you knows that and you know that the poorer classes of migrants tend to get pushed into the lowest paid greatest risk taking jobs right here in mumbai you'll find that building contractors they get people from kalahandi they get people from very poor areas in madhya pradesh jabua they get people from koraput in odisha in southern odisha for a pretty for construction work and assign them the construction work above the 10th floor you see after the 5th floor you have to pay 5 rupees more per day and after the 10th floor there is an additional amount they can't if they do that to local labor in mumbai no one will take it and you know i mean local labor would demand a lot more money and they are also tend to they tend to be slightly more organized what happens when someone from koraput working on very poor scaffolding falls from the 15th or 20th floor and dies it could be two months before his family in koraput gets to know of it 
So it's always a good thing, bet, to use poor migrants. Now, who are these migrants? Are they all one kind of person? No. Again, social inequalities are significantly replicated in economic inequalities and realities. Dalits make up 16.8 or 17 percent of our population. Adivasis make up 8.2 8 percent of our population. But they make up a very disproportionate share of migrant laborers. Let's take just one example from the latest report of the ILO. Those of you who know Odisha know Kalahandi. And those of you who know Kalahandi know that the poorest block in the district of Kalahandi, in the area, the region of Kalahandi, is called Tuamul Rampur. Tuamul Rampur has 77,000 households. Yeah. And two out of every three, two out of every three persons in Tuamul Rampur is either an Adivasi or a Dalit. They have huge migrations from Tuamul Rampur block, and those migrants come and slave in the cities and other towns and other villages in the riskiest jobs. And guess what? To that Tuamul Rampur, they send back each year in 2019 somewhere between 30 crores and 40 crores of rupees as remittances, which make the lives of those poor people somewhat better. Dalits and Adivasis are incredibly disproportionate in share among poor migrant laborers. So bear in mind when we're talking about migrants, we're not talking about one homogeneous group. And there are many different kinds of migrants. We can discuss that. You can have that in the discussion if you like. Now in the pandemic, in this period, more and more data has been coming out though, not from India. The gender inequality index, India now has fallen to 122 out of 162 countries. What, what is the rank of our neighbors in gender inequality? China, 39. Sri Lanka, 86. Bhutan, 99. Myanmar, Burma, old Burma, 106. All of them are ahead of us. India ranks 129 out of 189 countries in the 2019 Human Development Index of the United Nations. But when it comes to money and billionaires, we're ahead of all but four countries in the world. Sometimes we're ahead of um, all but three. Yeah. Also, what happened in this pandemic uh, also, what happened in this pandemic, we also get to know that during the year for, for the year 2019, the data has emerged, India ranks 94 out of 107 countries in the global hunger index. Yeah. So your hunger, your health issues, all these migrations, all these are actually manifestations of basic inequalities. As for women and gender, India has this incredible share of domestic workers. And anyway, 80% of domestic workers in the world are women. But some, uh, the ILO and Oxfam have produced some very great data on women's work. If the unpaid work by women done across the globe was carried out by a single company that company would have an annual turnover of 10 trillion, 43 times that of Apple. Women across the world carry out 12.5 billion B, billion hours of unpaid care work every single day. When valued at minimum wage, that would represent at least 10.8 trillion a year, more than three times the size of the global tech industry. Now, we could go on all night um, on the inequalities of, uh, of, the, the in, of India in terms of the, on the inequalities of India in terms of the 
economics of it, the gender of it, and the caste, and the caste divide as well. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and the caste divide as well. Now, let me show you a couple of. Uh, oh, well, I'll show you the tables at one time. Now, come to this agrarian crisis. The repeal of these three laws is absolutely necessary, but it is not going to solve your agrarian crisis. What the repeal of these three laws does is to staunch the bleeding and takes us back. It takes us back to where we were, which is not a very good place. What created this crisis over decades or since 1991? Um, what is that larger agrarian crisis in which these three laws are a, a milestones, further milestones on the highway to agrarian health? For 28 years, we have pursued extremely anti farmer policies, vigorously pursued by successive governments of UPA and NDA. The idea was get 40% of people out of agriculture, a wonderful idea cobbled together by McKinsey, the, the multinational corporation, in a report for Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu, the darling of the Indian media, at least then. Now they've got Mr. Modi. The drying up with a brief respite of public investment in agriculture, the diversion of credit from agriculture to agribusiness. Do you know all of you are familiar with the name NABARD, okay? Um, National Bank for Agriculture Rural Development. NABARD say in Maharashtra, its annual plan for potential linked credit plan assigns 53% uh, of all agriculture credit in Maharashtra. 53% of agricultural credit is disbursed in the metropolis of Mumbai. Now, where are the agriculturists in Mumbai? There are no agriculturists in Mumbai, but there is huge agribusiness. So money that was to be going to the farmers has for 20 years been going to corporations, to corporate houses. Uh, then in the name of market-based pricing, the choice, Cultivation costs exploded in the last three decades. You created a monopoly of corporate houses over inputs. Who controls seeds? Across the world, three, four companies account for 60% of all seed. They control 60% of the seed. Who controls fertilizer? Not farmers, private corporations. Who controls pesticides? Not farmers, private corporations. In the, in the new neoliberal, new economic reform zeal, we allowed market-based pricing under Dr. Manmohan Singh, by the way, on the count that this would, you know, would free market prices. It was a euphemism for price gouging. Monsanto seed, BT cotton seed, for 450 grams, went up to 1,800 rupees for a packet of 450 grams. That means one kilogram was 4,000 rupees. Cultivation costs exploded. An acre of unirrigated cotton in Vidarbha, the epicenter of suicides, used to cost 2,500 to 4,000 rupees. As late as 2003 or four, one acre of irrigated cotton 12,000, 10,000 to 12,000 an acre. Today, unirrigated cotton, unirrigated acre, 15,000 to 20,000 rupees per acre, and irrigated acre, 40,000 rupees upwards. Now that means the cost of cultivation may have gone up 500%. Did the farmer's income go up 500%? <laughs> Even if you double farmer's incomes, it means nothing where you have trapped them in a high cost economy, in a high cost, high input cost farming, 
And at the same time, we exploded these prices, pushed them to the sahukar by giving the money to the agribusiness. At the same time, the prices that farmers received collapsed. Why? Partly because of gigantic subsidies put to cotton and other object and other crops by the United States and the European Union. In 2006, the American subsidy for BT cotton, and by the way, if BT cotton is so good, if it is so efficient, why does it need subsidies of billions of dollars each year from the United States? The US gave out, it, it, it produced cotton worth about $3.7 billion, total value of its output. And the subsidy was $4.6 billion. The subsidy was more than the total value of the total output of cotton of the United States. The European Union then tried matching the United States pound for pound, dollar for dollar in subsidies and cotton prices collapsed, leading to a wave of suicides, not just in India, but in all the African countries that are also dependent on cotton for, a, for, its, for their meal ticket. Chad, Benin, Malawi, the West African countries, which depend on cotton as the thing. In the, in the meantime, we cut more and more money from agriculture, reduced our investment in agriculture, opened the doors for private control, pushed the farmers into the hands of sahukars because the banks, you know something guys, all those farm loan waivers are nothing compared to the 75% of total NPA value that is accounted for by big business and corporations. Yeah. You, you make a great thing about writing off 25,000 or 50,000 rupees for a farmer who, whose disaster was not his or her fault, but you, you loan 9,000 crores and more to Vijay Madhya, who you know you are never going to get it back from. The indebtedness of the Indian farmer more than doubled. From 40, from 21.6%, uh, 28.6, 26 26.6% of all households to 48.6% of all households by 2002. Then they started fiddling the numbers. In the last 20, one years in the last 21 22 years the government of india admits that 3 lakh 30 thousand farmers have taken their own lives that figure is ghastly enough but it is still a very great underestimate the numbers of people losing their status as full-time farmers you know a full-time farmer is defined in the census as someone who has done cultivated a plot of land or supervised its cultivation for 180 days or more in the year. That means at least six months, which means you are drawing your primary income from agriculture. We need a definition like that because otherwise every corporate executive who tends to his grape vineyard on Saturdays and Sundays becomes a farmer. But if you take the full-time farmer, the main cultivator, 180 days or more, their population has fallen by 15 million in 20 years between the 1991 census of India and the uh, 2011 census of India, full-time farmers were quitting agriculture at the rate of 2000 a day or a total of 15 million. Where did they go? If you look at the next column in the census, you can see that as the column of the numbers of farmers has plummeted, the numbers of agricultural workers has exploded. It's gone up, which means millions of farmers have fallen into the ranks of the agrarian underclass. Millions of allied livelihoods collapsed alongside the farmer, the, the weaver, the tailor, the potter, the carpenter. See, typically in a village, there will be one or two mystery families, carpenters. One third of their income comes from cash. They work for the farmers and two thirds of their income comes from 
in, in uh, produce so many quintals of rice or wheat, so many kilograms of tomato, sometimes some cooked food, all this comes to them. When farming goes bankrupt, the carpenter starves. When farming goes bankrupt, the weaver goes bankrupt before the farmer takes his life, the weaver takes his or her life. These allied occupations constitute what, call, what becomes the larger agrarian society, which is not just about agriculture, but millions of other people dependent on the agricultural economy. So this was the crisis, all your migration crisis. How was it discussed? How, was, how did we discuss that crisis? We discussed it in, in the media, in the corporate media, in terms of uh, why are they leaving? Why are they going back to their village? We never asked the question, why did they leave their villages to come here in the first place? What I've told you in the last five minutes, that crisis is the reason they left their villages to come here. That was the crisis that drove tens of millions of people into the largest migrations in our history. The agrarian crisis has long since stopped being an agrarian crisis. It went from a crisis in agriculture to an agrarian crisis. In the last 10 years, it went, some 10 years ago, it became a societal crisis. Today, it might be described as an civilizational crisis. On what, uh, it's a civilizational crisis in, in the sense that the largest body of smallholders in agriculture in the world are fighting for their very survival. Now, that was the, so you can see that the crisis of those farmers there in Delhi was not the result of just these three laws. The three laws was a quick death sentence to what was a slow bleed over, over two and a half decades. Now the, and the very things that caused that crisis are sharpening by the day in terms of inequality. Now you guys, IIT, IIT Madras, or is it, I don't know if you call it officially IIT Chennai these days, need to know, for instance, many of you guys will be going into the digital sector, into the information sector, though I'm sure you'll go into other sectors as well. Let me show you what that inequality, even before the pandemic, does to children trying to study in your country under this situation of the huge emerging racket called online education. Okay. How many girls do you think in the country study or even in the cities? How many girls below the age of 16 own smartphones? Hmm? How many households, rural households, have computers? How many rural households? have access, and I'll show you how closely it is tied to how egalitarian or inegalitarian a, a society it is. Um, uh, Kaushik and Libin, I'm sharing screen now. Okay? Yes, sir, yeah. Okay, now here are the tables. These are from the latest data, 2018. Social, it's called um, social indicators of consumption in education. Now I'm going to increase the size of this and I hope you can, can you guys see it? The uh, table? Yes, sir. Yeah, I can see the table in a good enough size. Yeah. Okay. Percentage of, this is 2018 data. Percentage of persons of age, five years and above with ability to operate computer for different states. Let's take Karnataka, proud mother of Indian Silicon Valley. And of course, we boast that it's our guys who run California Silicon Valley as well. Percentage of people above the age of five with ability to operate computer. Rural Karnataka, 12.6. Female, 7.4. And total, male, 12.6. Female, 7.4 total 10.1. One in every 10 people in rural Karnataka, population 86 million, one in every 10 
has the ability to operate a computer. What a goddamn shame. Hmm. Now look at rural and urban put together. Male 23, female 15, person 19.3. So in the mother, in the mother load of India's Silicon Valley, one in every five person has the ability to use a computer. Okay. Now, <laughs> but uh, your the figures you can look at all the great dynamic states. Maharashtra, richest state in the country. Look at Gujarat, Mr. Modi's Gujarat, with its development model. Okay, it's how much better is it with all its NRIs with everything else? Twenty two point two percent of the population, rural plus urban. Its indicators are as dismal as Karnataka's or anyone else. But look at two southern states, which have more egalitarian society, where equal inequality is relatively less. There are high inequalities, but relatively less. Look at the fact of Kerala. Okay, look at Kerala. 41.5%. Okay, almost, you know, say, not half, but getting there, one in every two persons, certainly one in every uh, 2.5 people can operate a computer in Kerala. And look at the rural figures. The rural, the figures, the figure of uh, women in rural Kerala, the figure of women in rural Kerala is higher than the figure of men in urban Karnataka. Oh, sorry. I, I'm sorry. Then urban Uttar Pradesh, urban West Bengal, urban uh, several other states. The rural women in uh, Kerala are more competent in larger numbers to operate a computer than the men in several states. Percentage of households with computer and internet facility. This is crazy. Okay. Karnataka, rural Karnataka, 2%. 2% of rural households yeah, have computers. 8.3% have internet facilities. Urban households, 22.9 and 38.5. Rural and urban combined the great Karnataka, 10.7% and 18.8%. Now again, uh, look at, I'm sorry, I did, I dropped, the, uh, yeah, look at Kerala. And by the way, please note that Uttar Pradesh has more computers in rural household, double that of Karnataka. I suspect this could be possible because maybe Ghaziabad, Noida are counted as rural. I don't know how that calculation is made, but it shows you that Karnataka is not better than Uttar Pradesh in this, in this computer and internet facility. There is a reason why more several households in Uttar Pradesh will have internet facility on their phones because migrant neighbors, laborers need it. Look at Kerala. Internet facility, 51.3% uh, compared to 18.8% in Karnataka. Go to percentage of persons of age five years and above with ability to use internet, the skill to use internet. Karnataka, rural, 12.1%. 12.1% male and female average of people above the age of five with the ability to use internet. Kerala, 41.0, 41, three and a half times Karnataka. And look at, you can keep looking at Gujarat and see how dismal those figures are as well. Percentage of persons who actually use the internet during the last 30 days for different states. Karnataka, was 
18%. Tamil Nadu is 21.4%. Kerala, 38.1%. Okay. So, look at the levels of inequalities that we are talking about. In the last one year, companies like Baiju have more than doubled their market value from $5.5 billion to, I'm told, $11 billion on last count and rising and rising. So that is one, sec one kind of inequality that you need to be particularly concerned about, especially being from the very privileged confines of the Indian Institutes of Technology. You know, how are we going to reach out to these kids? We did a story from Palgar, the Adivasi dominated district of Maharashtra. We could not find one girl below the age of 16 who had a smartphone and they were dependent for their online education on big brother coming back from the brick kiln on Saturdays and Sundays borrowing his phone for two hours if he would give it to them, downloading their PDFs and things for a higher package to be able to do all of that. Yeah. So you've got that also in your inequality. Uh, in the, consider that the crisis, uh, but one more thing about the people out there. As I said, I didn't want to replicate and duplicate the things that uh, Viju had said to you, but you need to know that those farmers there, the laws they are fighting, the laws they are fighting are not just laws that affect farmers, okay? They are laws that affect uh, all of you. They affect every citizen. And they deny the citizen, Indian citizen, legal recourse in case of dispute. So Mr. Ambani or Mr. Adani, or whichever corporation it is signing contracts can get away with anything. I'm sharing with you the relevant clauses from the laws, and you can see what kind of thing is what kind of things are being done that affect the Indian people as a whole. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just have a look at this. These are the kind of things in the laws. Article 18 and 19 of the contracts law, no suit, no prosecution or other legal proceedings shall lie against the central government or against the state government or any officer of the central government or of the state government or any other person in respect of anything, which means any vigilante, anybody, corporations, anybody can do anything. And if it's done in good faith, it cannot be challenged. Who's to define good faith? No civil court shall have jurisdiction to entertain any suit of proceedings. By the way, they're now going to use this as a model. They have just used these very clauses in the Karnataka Anti-Cow Slaughter Ban. The, in fact, it gives immunity for vigilantes and gao rakshaks who will go and murder some poor cattle owner. And it says all, all persons are deemed to be, you know, uh, all persons are deemed to be of good faith acting under this law. You know, it extends legal immunity to all of them. So you are actually seeing vigilantism legitimized by law. And that is the law Karnataka is trying to ramp through. Now, I'm not going to say any more about the laws because I know that we just spoke to you about them. If you wish to ask me about them, you can. But in conclusion, in conclusion, what are the things that you can do? What kind of an agenda can you build? I go back to Ambedkar and the Constitution. If you cannot deal with those structural inequalities, the lack of democracy in society and economy. If we can't deal with that, we cannot deal with this crisis. We might override this crisis for a little while, but we'll come back to it big time. We'll come back to it big time. We have no choice. Because what we are trying to do 
with little ad hoc actions is trying to mop the floor dry with all the taps open and running. That, and you know how, what kind of results you're going to get from that. There is something on which we can unite people to make things larger from a movement of agriculturists, from farmers to larger people's movements. And in 2018, two lakh farmers gathered in Delhi near parliament. And we had a group of people of which I was one called the Nation for Farmers, non-farmers supporting farmers, where we said, call a full session of special session of parliament to discuss the agrarian crisis and related issues and exclusively focus on those something that the farmers are now demanding. We, and by the way, 21 political parties, except the BJP and BSP, all the political parties came on that platform and supported that charter that the farmers themselves put up, which included the demand for a special session of parliament. In that special session of parliament, there were a number of things that I had asked for. And by the way, on 19th, 20th, 21st of this month, since the government is cuttling the winter session, Nation for Farmers, the Jan Saroka, we are going to have a special session of the Janata Parliament. You are welcome to attend it. Please attend it and try and intervene if you can. Now, those, um, those kind of, uh, those kind of uh, demands would include, I believe you cannot solve this agrarian crisis. You can solve the current situation. You can bring down the suicides. You can take the, your foot off the farmer's neck. But the larger agrarian crisis, we cannot solve it if we do not address the problems of women farmers, Dalit farmers, Adivasi farmers, the agricultural workers, if we are not taking all, I mean, the present, demand, present agitation the largest agricultural labor organizations of Punjab are very much part of it. But I'm saying in the long run, we need to address their problems on a more permanent basis. Otherwise, we can't. There is a starting point, and I'll leave you with that. It's in your constitution, not just in the preamble, but in the uh, directive principles of state policy. There are half a dozen principles. You know, rather than uniting people on someone's individual ego or on some political party's manifesto, I think it will be much more acceptable to the people of this country if you built on the directive principles of state policy. By the way, what the farmers there are demanding is very much in consonance with the directive principles. But there are five, there are more. There is the right to work. There is the right to health and nutrition, the right to food, the right to shelter. There are a certain bunch of rights there, which if you actually implement and make them justiciable fundamental rights, you would have had a tremendous democratic revolution. Yeah. So that's a starting point from where I would like you to think about you. Otherwise, Every action we have undertaken on economic policy since 1991 violates the constitution. The directive principles begin by saying it is the aim, should be the aim of the state to mitigate and end inequalities, social, cultural, political, economic. It says that. It asks us to fight inequality. Every policy that we have made Professor Surjit Bala has written celebrating inequalities, saying that competition comes up, initiative comes up. The fact is that inequalities are greater today than they have been at any time in India since the 1920s. Start with those directive principles and take it from there. We have a chance of fighting those inequalities. In the immediate context, start by extending your support to those lakhs of farmers at Delhi's gates who are fighting for the rights of us all, 
for they are fighting for all of us because they are fighting against the removal of the right to legal recourse for citizens which is being which affects every one of us they are fighting for food prices not being under corporate control which means that they are fighting for you and me they are aware of it it's not just punjab it's not just farmers they're fighting for all of us thank you Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful talk. So uh, I just uh, want to make a one single comment. So since you ended on a note about uh, uh, the uh, constitution and how we can take this struggle further from these constitutional values, there is this uh, insightful document called "States and Minorities," written by Ambedkar. So it was it was written by him in 1947. So and if you look at the document. Uh, Uh, it, it has a mini version of a constitution there. It's a small skeletal version of a constitution there with uh, different uh, the, the, the different sections on the fundamental rights and uh, um, how the states and the center in should interact. What all the rights should be given to different sections of the people and all that. And so that's a very insightful document. I think people, everybody here should read, particularly sections on uh, safeguards against economic exploitation. which uh baba saheb ambedkar has given a very insightful uh, vision of how indian society would turn up with with the different political structures so how will it turn out with different economic and political structures in the future so i think it's a wonderful document to understand the constitutional values in a more deeper sense so yeah i i totally agree with you i i'm aware of the document i totally agree with you i would also ask everyone to read that 1949 speech in the constituent assembly one man one vote one value yeah and the absence of democracy in society and equality i think there is an incredible amount to be learned from the doc we are finding very pleasing me that in the people's archive of rural india some of the most visited documents in our online free online library are ambedkar's writings on these subjects so yeah i mean i i couldn't agree more and in fact one of one of the reasons as i said i did not say it as a formality when i said that i am honored to be on the platform of ambedkar peria study circle i was looking at your poster i grew up as a child in chennai and was educated by the then robust then robust dravida movement it was the you know periyar on class that made me first aware of what the heck the manuskriti was about it was periyar on class that made me aware of a lot of things um, you know as a 10 year old growing up at the height of the dravida movement in chennai it was ambedkar who in the last 35 years that i had lived in mumbai and in the few years before that that i was in delhi whose insights into the nature of inequalities what he called graded inequalities of india gave me in, gave me an understanding of inequality that i simply did not possess and the third person on your poster is my journalism hero but people unfortunately only know of bhagat singh as a radical revolutionary marxist um a thinker and he was all of those but please know this bhagat singh was a professional journalist who wrote in four languages published massively in four languages in dozens of journals and all of that by the time he was hanged at the age of 23 your your i have saved your poster maybe i might even use it as a screen saver but uh, i that is what i you know anyway i'm sorry go ahead uh, yeah go. thank you sir so yeah so i i think i just posted a poster on the screen share so um yeah so uh one second sir so i think yeah 
So uh, I think we can open up uh, the uh, uh, session for uh, the breakout room. So and six. So I think I may have made some share. Uh, yeah, stop share. Okay. So I think we can uh, start our question answer session. Uh, people who want to raise their questions, please, there's an option called raise hand. You can uh, use that option by the bottom. You can see three dots. Click on that, you will hit the option called raise hand. You can raise hand and uh, uh, the hosts and the co-hosts can unmute you one by one so that you can have a Q&A with the speaker. So I'll unmute first Sachin. So yeah, Sachin, you can unmute yourself, I hope, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Ambedkar Peria, uh, Peria Student uh, uh, Association of uh, Chennai Madras. Uh, I sir, uh, hello, I'm Professor Sachin Bansode uh, from Mumbai. Yes, uh, you. Hello, yes, of course, sir. Professor Bansode. I remember. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you gave a talk on uh, our Ambedkar Sputi Prerna Kendra. Uh, sir, uh, I want to uh, ask some more inputs or insight focus on one point that uh, in, uh, in 1918, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar in his first uh, uh, writing on the uh, topic of the agriculture in the small holdings of India and their remedies, he gives some suggestions for the uh, uh, reformation in the agriculture field. He stated that as uh, more than 75% people are depend in the agriculture. So agriculture sh sector should be given uh, as a status of industry. And that is also a national important industry because more people depend on the industry. So on the same line today, uh, we should or all agricultural farmers or uh, the union leaders uh, must demand that uh, uh, agriculture should give the status of the national important industry and second uh, the uh, farmer naturally should get the all benefit which is eligible for the uh, the uh, national servant like a central state government servant whatever the benefit uh, eligibility social uh, security or the legal uh, security provided to the uh, regular employees of the state and central government, that benefit protection should be, social security should be provided to the farmer. Uh, then third uh, demand uh, can we make is about the special agriculture budget, like a um, railway budget which uh, prepare, the special uh, agriculture budget at the central and state level. Uh, for the development and the uh, management of the agriculture field. And uh, another thing is that uh, as uh, these three laws is basically uh, is unconstitutional. If uh, uh, that uh, agricultural, agriculture related all activity uh, is come under the uh, schedule, uh, uh, schedule uh, nine uh, list uh, uh, one is a union list, yeah. list yeah. two, state list. In the state list, all agriculture related management and revenue and tax related activity is come under the state. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so, I'm aware of that. So, can, yes. I, can I respond to these? I mean, because there's a lot of things you said. Okay, okay, yeah. sir. So, yeah. so uh, the thing is, you know, as you're aware, Ambedkar also said a lot about agriculture later, including nationalization of land, many, many, many other suggestions he made. The problem here is twofold. One is Ambedkar believed in and helped build a welfare state. What we have seen in the last 25 years is the dismantling of the wealth. We need to rebuild the welfare state for many of those suggestions to have for, to take many of those suggestions forward. In fact, what you are seeing in these laws is a further shift away, further shift away from a welfare state 
to a market-based good, right? In the name of market economics and in the philosophy of market fundamentalism. Now, um, if you, I would look at today the fight to preserve and restore the welfare state that Ambedkar had in view, in mind, which he, which he tried his best to build in this country. That I think, if we are going, if we are going to try anything further, by the way, uh, I think he had views on land ownership, on national ownership, on many things. And I think that we are going to have to have major debates on what is, how we look at ownership of land. I said it in my talk that if we do not look at the, the rights, the rights to land, the rights to farming of Dalit farmers, Adivasi farmers, women farmers, we are doomed. We cannot do anything about it. I would say that in the current time, I would ask that we look at agriculture as livelihoods in our time. People are, it's not just how much output there is, it's not how many kilograms in a welfare state, you'd be looking at those numbers in terms of how much income the person is getting, how much support the person needs. But today we are looking at the state which is determined to take 40% of people out of agriculture without giving them any alternative options. So we look at it in terms of livelihoods. Agriculture for me isn't a job, it's a livelihood. It isn't how many quintals per acre, though small farms are more productive. And we need, and, and how much, and uh, how that ownership, future ownership of Indian farming what kind of models we can bring in. I think there are interesting things happening in the country, like say the Kudumbashree movement in Kerala, where women who are landless have formed 70,000 collectives and run small farms. And they are the only small farmers I've seen in 25 years make profits, except in two years because climate change has been destroying their agriculture. We need to think of a lot of other things about how to revive and save agriculture. But I take your point. See the special agriculture budget, by the way, they are doing away. They are doing away with their railway budget, right? The special railway budget. I think that we are looking at a dimension. I think we are looking at that end, end outcome, which Baba Sahib made in that speech the social and economic inequalities, the lack of democracy in society and economy, how that's going to explode our political democracy and whether agriculture or industry, all kinds of ownership, I think we have to approach in that vision. Yeah, next. The next, I think Ayan has, uh, Ayan has asked. Yeah, Ayan, please go ahead. Uh, it is really a privilege to listen to life to you. I'm a faculty here in the Department of Physics. Thank you. So I, I want to want to get you, get your insights on certain things about uh, this. You mentioned the migrant crisis and also in 2002, uh, there was this uh, diversion of grains for export and that you, you think that affected 2004 elections. Uh, but we have seen repeatedly despite demonetization and despite the present migrant crisis, the election results doesn't show up or even presently in Bihar, we, the, the results didn't show up in elections. Although on the ground, we are seeing, of course, uh, very sustained uh, protests and uh, not, I mean, self-organized protests, not at the behest of political parties. So how does this uh, contradiction can be resolved uh, in your opinion? Can you give us something about it? See, elections, election outcomes, are on many, happen on many factors and many issues. In 2004, they certainly happened on the back of farmer distresses. The suicides were a very major issue in, and the biggest defeat was suffered by Mr. 
Chandrababu Naidu in Andhra and Mr. S. M. Krishna in Bangalore. Both of them, both of them had, you know, pushed vigorously on those kind of policy. What the Sant Parivar and the Hindutva Vadis have succeeded in doing is to change the kind of polarization. They've worked at it for decades. And in the last few years, they have changed the polarization from a from an you know they managed to break the economic emerging economic polarization, the political polarization, on the basis of caste and communal polarization. Now, one thing, uh, Ayan, when when fundamentalism grows, casteism grows. You have cabinet ministers who are saying, who have cab ministers of the union cabinet and ministers of state in the union government have said the Manusmriti should be the true constitution of India. Have they not? The fact is that they have managed to break the polarization on the other sides, on the other aspects, and consolidate a polarization on hatred, on communal poison, on sectarian warfare. That's right. So, uh, that is actually part of the challenge of how to go forward politically. Now, they see, even now, as the farmers sit at the gates of Delhi, they've already started two, three familiar songs. Leftists and Maoists have infiltrated the movement. Second, they say that, uh, that was one. Second, there are Khalistanis out there. Third, all these guys are from Punjab. It has nothing to do with the rest of the country. By the way, I'm not so sure that the election results, that, that there are no election results to tell you otherwise. After the demonetization, they lost three elections in three states from where they get their major number of seats in parliament. They lost Chhattisgarh, they lost Rajasthan, they lost Madhya Pradesh. Outside of Karnataka, what does the BJP have in the South? It is that Hindi belt which is crucial to them. And many of the other seats came courtesy their allies in other states. The fact is that even a discredited, decrepit, decaying Congress party was able to win three victories in their home territory. One. Second, you know, Bihar, because of the opinion polls, we are all disappointed. But I want to say that a 0.03% difference in the vote isn't such a great deal. Okay, It's a very, very narrow thing. And in the national elections last time, see, by the way, in 2014, they climbed on to the class polarization. In 2014, Mr. Modi promised implementation of the Swaminathan Commission's recommendations within 12 months of coming to power. He promised all those things that he is today fighting against with the farmers. He promised MSP will be equal to cost of production plus 50% to be implemented in 12 months. Millions and millions of farmers voted on that promise. Within one month of coming to power, within months of coming to power, he went and filed an affidavit in the court saying, we cannot do this, it's not feasible, it would distort market prices. Showing you that market, not massive, were important. So I'm saying elections are fought on very different grounds and then op the government then operates on many other grounds, right? So you're, I'm saying that, you know, to my mind, the fact is that the culture of communal hatred, the culture of, uh, um, sectarian and pol polarization that has taken very major hold in your country and I think we should recognize it and not risk, you know, we, we can't wish it away, it's there. What we do about it, do we also build on such lines? That is the worst folly that we could commit. We have to fight to create the polarization on of that of the mass interest, of the public interest, of the millions, hundreds of millions of 
marginalized people versus the top you know you know how you know how narrow the elite of this country is i in 1991 when we began our path to the new world new brave new world of neoliberalism india did not have a single did not have a single dollar billionaire in 2018 we had 121 dollar billionaires in the forbes list and their cumulative net worth equaled 22% of gross domestic product giving that whole other meaning to the word gross 121 individuals in a population of 1.3 billion accounted for wealth equal to 22% of gross domestic product right over a fifth nearly a fourth of your gdp now you compare that with the with the with the earnings and incomes or wages of rural poor of rural indians we had in 2012 you remember the socio economic caste census what did that show us it showed us 75% of rural households how many rural households are there 179 million in the 2011 census out of those 18 crore rural households in 75% of them the main breadwinner was taking home 5000 rupees or less how much is that 60 dollars okay if you raise the bar to 10000 rupees you raise the bar to 10000 rupees it was 90% of rural household the main breadwinner took home less than 10000 rupees what percentage of rural indian households took main breadwinner had 10000 or more 8% but then again all rural indians are not the same if we abstract dalit households and adivasi households for sc st households that 8% falls to about 4% who are the dalits and adivasis households in rural india where the breadwinner takes home more than 10000 i think you would agree with me that it is most likely to be government servants school teachers bank clerks highway workers pwd workers and those are the jobs we have been cutting and bleeding and removing so that the public sector has lost more than 2 million jobs in the last two and a half decades so you look you need we need to focus on the inequality and debunk the mythical and farcical inequalities of communal hate thank you the next i think we'll ask saurav uh, to yeah. raise his question yeah Uh, thank you very much uh, thank you for such a enlightening talk uh, mr p sainath it is it is really a pleasure to hear you live i have a couple of questions uh, can you please elaborate on the statement that you earlier said that small farms are more productive and uh, another issue regarding agriculture is uh, can you, you know elaborate on the uh, underemployment in agriculture Uh, another question that i wanted to ask is what do you say to the youths uh, uh, youths attitude of anti politics that sorry, is the second question was what i listed small farms are more productive i got what is the second one under employment in agriculture yeah uh, the another question that i have is that uh, what do you say to the youth which are anti politics means uh they hate on the government for their bad policies but they ignore the private power uh yeah okay yeah uh, sorry thank you sorry there are you know uh, with all the subsidies given say for cotton to by the united states and european union hmm your farmers were still producing 
they are cotton much cheaper okay what does that tell you about who was more productive and who was more cost who had a better cost benefit ratio right we didn't we didn't give our farmers you know more you know output 3.7 billion subsidies 4.6 billion yeah and then you produce so many million tons your farmer has systematically whether in paddy whether in wheat beat the prices that have come and only been beaten by those prices when those subsidies have gone beyond anything that an indian farmer can dream of many so if you look at yeah there is going to be greater also please also know that some of the so called productivity of major of particular kinds of agriculture including in the punjab are not going to be long term sustainable we are running agriculture on steroids in this country most of your poor farmers are default not doing that yeah they are growing a much more sustainable kind of agriculture though unfortunately given the propaganda situation if they had more money they would also go in for more and more chemical fertilizer but the fact is that indian that the indian farmer who is much less chemical intensive much less capital intensive if you factor in all those they are far more product and there are studies to show you that um i am not quite clear on what you meant about what do you want me to say about underemployment in agriculture the point is this that the policies that we followed destroyed tens of millions of livelihoods in agriculture people had livelihoods people had and i think there's a big difference between a job and a livelihood that and there's a difference between you know see one of the things that dr swaminathan said in his report is we need to be looking at growth in agriculture not in terms of kilo quintals of output but in terms of growth of income of the farmer and the labor i i go with that i think that's a much better way of looking at it the underemployment look the whole point of getting people out of agriculture was to drive huge huge seas and ocean of cheap labor perpetually demoralized to the cities and towns where we thought we are going to have a great industrial revolution none of which had any chance of happening in the first place so you are not only going to continue with underemployment where it is you are going to have higher and higher mounting forms of full unemployment plus you are going to have um disguised employment uh, and a lot of underemployment if i have understood your question youth who are anti politics you know um who are anti government and this thing but a lot of us have been there at some point in our life you know um uh, but and one thing i'll tell you drawing room outrage changes nothing drawing room outrage raging in your drawing room and your private forum takes you nowhere the and a very common cop out very common call from my you know from decades ago to now is to say i hate politics you know not being aware that you are in fact choosing a form of politics and that you are actually practicing the politics of status quo by doing nothing to disturb the status quo since you are saying i'm staying away i don't like politics i'm not going to get involved you know there are very different ways and levels at which people can get involved politics is not partisan politics the media project this politics as bjp versus congress politics is the oxygen of democracy if you do not have politics what do you do i will just quote from you from for me the poster put up by students fellow students of mine which had the most 
impact on me of any student political poster. When I entered JNU in 1977, the first poster I saw at the gate was that it said, when politics decides whether you will enter this university or not, when politics decides if you will get admission or not, when politics decides what, what you will study and who will teach you, when politics decides if you will get a job when you leave this place, when politics decides all these things, decide what your politics will be. Yeah. So yes. that's my message to your anti-political friends. Uh, just, just, just to follow up, sir. That uh, hating government and people hate government policies means not just policies, uh, but they ignore private power. Yeah. Means Correct. yeah, that that that, 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 that. That's what I meant when I say you have to decide what your politics will be. I believe that the great political challenge of our time is standing up to corporate power. Right. That is to power across the world. Look at your $121 billionaires. Look at the United States. Look at the fact, I told you that your corporate bosses added 35% to their already hundreds of billions. They went up to a total value of 435 billion. Please look at what you could do to your health budget with 10% of that. 1% uh, tax on your, on your rich. Yeah. And you could maybe double your one to two percent tax on your super rich you could double your health budget you have to stand up to corporate power agriculture is being suborned to corporate power in fact there's a very lovely poster going around on the internet i don't know if you've seen it it says farmers should talk directly to adani and Adwa and ambani why do they need all these middlemen like modi and shah don't talk to middlemen talk to them directly it's a very funny and cynical post, a very funny and very true because you are really confronting corporate power. The media that you are so dissatisfied with, who are they? They are corporations. Why are they supporting the government against the farmers? Mr. Ambani is the biggest leader of corp a biggest corporation in India, one of the biggest in the world. He is also the biggest owner of media in India and many of the other big newspapers and channels are all owned by corporations. Why are they going to end up supporting the farmers? Confronting corporate power is the great and immediate challenge of our time. So, you know, you, you know, by saying I don't like politics, I hate government, but I will remain silent on this. You're kidding yourself. Okay, so uh, we we'll, we'll go to the next question, Shravya. But before that, I think uh, uh, we would like to uh, conclude the event roughly at 8 o'clock or maybe we can go till 8 15 i think is it okay i'm okay, I'm okay. go on yeah okay sir. so i unmute the next uh, yeah next person to ask the question Shalia, please go ahead thank you so much uh, sir it's really been an honor to actually uh, listen to you i'm shavya i'm a student from madras school of social work yeah. i just have a couple of questions uh, my first one is, uh, there's this web portal called uh, eCrop e or ePanta uh, for the farmers, where, uh, uh, you know, the farmer can actually get the uh, estimation of supply and demand of a particular produce. Since, like, uh, you've, all, you've mentioned about the statistics about the digital uh, knowledge and accessibility in rural and urban areas, do you think that uh, portals like these would, uh, you know, help the farmers to at least uh, get a better price or rather like, like improve their income? That's my first. Uh, my second question is, you've, uh, you've also mentioned uh, where the government is still yet to pay. Like, uh, you know, I completely agree with that, where some of the governments are yet to pay the farmers where they've actually uh, on the outside have told that we we are buying the crops i mean produced from the farmers but uh, on the other hand they act, they're actually they owe the farmers uh, to be i mean to put it in a better way they they owe the farmers a lot of money but uh, that amount is going into other uh, at the, is directed to different things so in 
situations like these where uh, in our country we completely believe that you know anything related to agriculture or farmers it is to do with government but where in the government uh, on like is doing things like these where uh, they are not paying the farmers and taking their uh, produce away how, how do you think uh, is that of like how how helpful is that where the government is taking most of the control and uh, the third uh, and the last one that i have is that uh, so the youth in our country today like uh, are like some of them are not really aware of what what is happening with the agriculture uh, aspect of it even though we have <clears throat> i'm sorry even though we have the digital media where a lot of things are being circulated where we can gather a lot of knowledge about it what is your take on uh, the farmers actually not you know they're not okay with their own kids uh, taking up agriculture because they think it's yeah, like it's I, not good at all I get it. Firstly, about the e-portals, there have been several put up by corporation or by front organizations of corporation. There have been each of all etc., which are actually very common. Hmm. So it is not that the farmer is being made the king; it is that they are trying to sew up sector after sector. Second, so it depends on. that portal who owns it who runs it for what purpose is it for profit what is its purpose and rationale and who is behind that portal you need to find that out for yourself i'm not aware of the one you're talking about but i'm aware of many others which are essentially market research arms of corporation or market penetration arms of corporation you need to check that out second the government is not having any strength. the government is dismantling state intervention in agriculture it is dismantling state intervention in agriculture part of the confusion you are talking about arises from this demonization of the apmcs that you know that they are not giving the farmers a choice you need savia to consider this whole nonsense of this word that capitalism gives you a choice if the 1.2 hungry you know according to the un there are 1.2 billion very hungry people in the world right if if the 1.2 billion very hungry people in the world had a choice i suspect they would choose to eat but since they are unable to eat and that they remain hungry i have to conclude that they don't have any damn choice they have a choice between not eating and starving and that's the choice imposed on them hmm. or your apmc Who, to, who gave people the idea? It's your entire media offensive that the APMCs are some sort of gulag, you know, trapping farmers. Do you know how the bulk, the overwhelming share of agricultural marketing transactions take place outside the APMC, and the stranglehold is that of private trade. Now we are moving from small private trade to the stranglehold of corporations. every night overwhelmingly farmers small farmers in this country don't even approach the apmc they sell at the farm gate to the sahukar the money lender the commission agent the contract person to whom they from whom they took borrowed money for the farming operation and he has the right of first refusal on it most of agricultural produce in india doesn't reach that money as you and i are talking today on december 12 2020 farmers in kalahandi are pledging the crop of 2022 and crop of 2023 to the money lender to the creditor in order to get credit why did they go to the, why do they keep having to go to that guy because they're not going to get loans from public sector banks they're not going to get loans from the uh, from the government the government has shifted institutional credit away from the farmers to the agri business and the corporation why is the, why is that farmer why is that farmer pledging the crop of 2022 because she pledged the crop of 2020 3 years ago that is the life of that farmer and the apmc came 
to break that stranglehold. In the Punjab and Haryana, people were able to access the MSP. Do you know that there, are, there is an MSP on 23 crops, as Vijay must have told you, but it's only on two crops that people can access it. It's only on two crops that wheat and rice. Even in Punjab, they're not able to access it on others. If you had more state intervention, and by the way, which is the country you're aware of in the world that doesn't subsidize agriculture, that doesn't subsidize your stomach and mind? Which country? The richest countries in the world are the biggest subsidizers of agriculture. The difference between them is that they are giving subsidies to giant corporations. And in your country, you're trying to give life support to small struggling people who put the food on your table. I am saying state intervention is a must in agriculture, but there is state intervention. Today, that state intervention favors corporations, not farmers, not people. You have to choose between, are you for corporate-led farming or community-led farming? That's a choice. You, um, the, the third thing you were talking about, my, your third question was about youth. And see the picture of what they have comes from the media they consume. Yeah. The media are corporations. The media are not ever going to smile on the idea of giving poor people more support. That's not going to happen. If you look at the last eight editorials of the Indian Express, the Times of India, Hindustan Times, there is a little crocodile compassion for the farmers, poor things, and there is a huge amount of condescension saying, you know, essentially these are stupid rural yokels. They don't understand. We have to explain to them the genius of economics of our, you know, neoliberal economists and our prime minister. We have to show them because he understands. You see, they don't understand. People who have done farming all their life don't understand. Hmm? But some moron sitting in Niti Ayo who says India has too much democracy. Yeah. This is a guy who understands farming and its economics, right? So you need, I think that there is a serious case for re-education. You know, Ambedkar's wonderful slogan. What was that? Educate, agitate, organize. I think that's where, that's what we need to do. But we need very seriously to break the brainwashing socialization apparatus of corporate media over youth, over everybody, not just over youth. The, the thing is this, that you are, you are shown a political economic framework where there is no other alternative, nothing else can be done. And your average newspaper in this country gives 0.67% of its front page to rural news, to news of rural origin. That's why groups like People's Archive of Rural India came into existence. There are a number of small experiments. By the way, I'm delighted to tell you that just for the last six months, we've had, we've got, we've more than doubled and tripled our number of page views because many people are realizing that they are not going to get to know the truth. How can, how can a bunch of corporations running media, how can those corporations and those media who are so deeply involved in the market ever tell you the truth about it. They, they have to heat their shares. They have to boost their interests. How can they tell you don't invest this season? Don't go into this sector, it's bad. They can't because you're investing money that goes to them. There are huge conflicts of interest involved. I think that there is a serious need like the APSC is doing with its series of talks. You need to have one on the media, on propaganda, in our times. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think we'll go with the next question. Uh, it's already eight, we'll try to wind up by 8.15. So yeah, uh, Arun, please go ahead. Good evening, sir. Actually, my question is just a continuation of the last question. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Now I can. Yeah. Uh, actually, my question is just a continuation of the last answer you said and about the media. Like all the right wing and corporate media and other newspaper, they are just they are just they are just gained, uh, getting out the 
the whole underground story about the farmer just just writing about that blah 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 other things but how to take these things to the the rural people as so called rural people or rural farmers who are most vulnerable things actually actually in this take the case of tamil nadu there is a perception like these acts only affect the punjab farmers or just these acts are affecting only the middleman brokers like farmers are not affected only middleman brokers the traders are affected and all the right wing the media people also also they are trending to this perception only so how to bring this as you said that there should be a there should be a debate in the media but i think i don't think like any of the media or newspaper are writing about this so how to bring I, this to the common people i That's said it. not debate in the media i said there should be a debate on the media yeah yeah okay you know uh, it's also like you know many journalists are fond of using the cliche of talking the truth to power right you heard that one i'm saying that sometimes that is not half as important as talking the truth about power hmm. you know when we said let's talk the truth to power we are assuming that power doesn't know the truth do you think that many of those many of those corporations our prime minister our agriculture you think they don't know the truth they believe a different truth okay they know this they know these truths very well and they know systematically that it is their objective to get tens of millions of people more out of agriculture now the whole point of propaganda is that i wish i had an answer to your question we are fighting the fight oh we pari people's archive by the way publishes in 12 to 13 languages very regularly in 11 languages we are publishing in languages which about a billion indians speak we lack resources we lack visibility but do in the corporate model we don't have an advertising revenue model we do not follow an advertising revenue model because we believe in independence from the state we do not work on government grants or private corporate grants direct corporate grants we work on random donations volunteers a hell of a lot on volunteer labor yeah and high net worth individuals who might give us some money foundations who might give us some money because if we don't want to become another corporation we know what the logic of corporate functioning produces it has to make money that's the bottom line is the bottom line so if if you are interested in seeing how to tackle that i think that all of you should be supporting the nearest initiative to you in media that tries put posing it differently and as i said i'm very pleased that in the last few months we've had a 1 and 1/2 million page views because of people finding that they're not getting any real information of the kind they want what impact did it have on livelihoods what did it do to the handicrafts industry what did the lockdown do to handloom weavers what did it do to the livelihoods of 40 50 different occupations in 35 different regions of the country yeah we are about to publish our 150th piece on that subject now if you knew it if you look at it and you circulate it amongst your friends that this that this source exists it is free of charge free access it is made for young people students children who cannot afford online education we have a whole special sub universe called pari education free some of the best teachers in the country are putting out material and people students like you are writing for it okay it's called pari education go we'll see it now we need this to grow and grow and grow and remember it's free there is no advertise concealed advertising selling you something there is no corporate interest but then also people need to help us like they need to like they need to help 
other non-corporate, non-government ventures in the media. Then we'll start making better progress. Okay, uh, sir, I think the next Sarabjit is there. Um, I'm, not, I'm very thankful to you for, uh, for demystifying. Could you, you hear raise me? the volume a little, please? Okay, I will do that. I, will, I have a really high volume, so I'll just hold my mic closer to me. Okay. Um, thank you so much for demystifying uh, you know, the laws and the, and the gradient crisis that has been growing in our country for almost two plus decades. Um, I have a, a bit of a you know, takeaway from what I've heard and from my other readings. And to me, it seems that the three laws are perhaps just chronic capitalism trying to control land, control the food grains, and also control the displaced labor that comes out of the agricultural sector and perhaps you know, the wages of the rural, of the urban uh, industrial sector will reduce further, which will just add to the corporate profits in, in a roundabout way. Now, you also know that the government is completely broke, you know, after the demonetization fiasco and the GST, which has completely broken the fiscal back of the government. Now, what I'm trying to understand is, if they did not help the migrants, if they did not help the, the you know, the small and the medium scale industry, and they did not give any bank credit to the, uh, to the economy when it really needed that help, this is a very easy way for them to walk away from procurement, because now the procurement that the money that they do spend is not, you know, is not in the fiscal budget anymore. But what it also does is that it takes away procurement from the government and gives it to the corporates. So what are we going to do about the public distribution system? Because the procurement actually stocks it, which means our hunger index, our starvation, and the inequalities that we have spoken about, the nutrition, and everything will just go for a bigger you bet. upheaval. You so bet. What are we going to do about that? Okay. Sarabdeep, you are you are you come to a very important point and I hope you will participate in the Janata Parliament on 19th, on 19th 20th, or 21st, where there are whole sections just on these issues. Now, you're absolutely right in making this connection between the laws and the dismantling of the public distribution system. Please note that already the function and role of the public distribution system underwent a very significant change even under the UPA. Now, the public distribution system came out inspired by two families. In fact, it was a popular initiative in Kerala, in the Malabar, after the Malabar famine. Some of the people who were to become Kerala's greatest politicians as teenagers participated in the building of what was called producers and consumers cooperatives, which gave a sort of prototype for a public distribution system. Fair price shops, that sort of thing. Then came the Bengal famine, you know, which just terrified the hell out of everyone in this country, quite correctly. After that, we built our public distribution system. It had many objectives. It had several objectives. Key amongst those objectives was that you will never have such a crisis again where people are going to starve to death and we don't have any grain. And incidentally, you came pretty close to that in 1965, you know, when the US halted food grain shipments to you. Yeah. But the idea was one, that a country should have a strategic reserve, a, a buffer stock, which you can release and distribute to people in times of a terrible crisis. The second purpose of it was, the second purpose of it was by having a big stock of grain, which you could release onto the market, part of it you could release. You could moderate the market price. So if the market price was 10x per quintal and you released 2 million quintals, there was no way that the market price could sustain at 10x per quintal. It would fall to 4x per quintal, whatever. So the point was that the public distribution system was to guard against 
deadly hunger and famine and two that you would moderate the price of food grain in the market and three you set up a chain of paperized shops hundreds of thousands of them to across the country where people could buy at that access at that controlled rate one of the problems was that you made that network of paperized shop you gave it to the lalas and the baniyas where you could have used it you could have set it up differently so that unemployed youth were given those jobs you it would have made a very big difference anyway you still did that and it worked for you to some extent in once the liberalization begins their entire aim is on how to take down the public distributions their enter now the stockpiling of food grain is not so much about moderating the market price but letting the market find its price by you're not releasing it onto the market so that you're shoring up the market price and montake and others have said this nonsensical thing that it's the higher prices are good for farmers first and foremost 77% of your indian farmers are net purchasers of food grain on the market high prices affect them that's why you have the whole idea of a subsidy that's why you have the whole idea if if you know the fundamental the most basic function of the human race is the production of food to sustain itself if a state cannot take responsibility for the feeding of its population i don't believe that state has a legitimacy to exist okay. so ever since the liberalization they've been cutting trimming cut one of the things they started doing by the way from the 90s is building very very little public storage space finally they end up hiring renting at huge sums of money to go down from from uh, keepers of manufacturers of liquor and beer in the punjab so wheat and grain are kept along with the beer and whiskey and you're paying huge sum when it is actually much cheaper for governments to build proper storage now you've got gigantic millions of tons out in the rains in the monsoon standing there in 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 gunny sacks in canvas okay so you've been systematically destroying the public distribution system and you've been exporting grain at rates cheaper than that with which you give it to your own people so that whole purpose itself changed they they are looking at the public distribution system as consider when you are exporting that grain sir jit when you are exporting that grain you are subsidizing those foreign buyers you have put thousands of crores into that subsidy and instead of going to your poor people your subsidy is going to the cattle of europe and us making them the most food secure creatures on the planet right so yeah the whole thing is about how you cannot in this direction once you go through with your three laws there's just one more step it's not that they are the beginning of the problem no. they're an advanced milestone on that highway to hell but once you do this the idea is that the corporations will take over the operations and by the way that's going to fail very badly unless you hand over public infrastructure and money to the corporation they are never going to um, invest their own money like Mr Adani is not investing any money in the airports he has been given airports built at cost of thousands of crores he has been gifted them free like in kerala where the government the opposition the people have all said no to it but the central government is giving it to them now the problem in marketing chains which they are expecting the private sector they made these rules in maharashtra in the apmc of wash no great private chains came because the indian corporate mind the indian rich they want they don't want to invest their money they want you to give me public money to put it in there 
like nabad has given it to them for agriculture right so that's the direction they are going we are in some serious trouble as far well as the right to food and we are in deep trouble we are in deep so what what would be the effect of the wto because you know they they talk of market altering prices and they have somehow managed to yeah well you know the wto with its green box red box all the sort of blue box red box when india suggested a green box at what time because <coughs> it's the way they define subsidy what they give is not subsidy what you know they talk about the huge subsidies india gives right now the fact is 90 billion dollars 100 billion dollars of subsidies each year from the united states eu i think the us alone had hit an obscene figure in 2018 that kind of money that huge amount of money uh that is not in the wto i'm saying that by the way i would i was always against our joining the institution and i said it will also collapse under its own weight whenever on the rare occasion that a decision has gone against the united states they have simply told the wto to stick it you know where they lost a case to brazil on court yeah. they told them to go to hell that entire thing was never made with your interest in mind yeah i am saying that one has to either renegotiate that whole thing or get out of it but and by the way the wto itself is a bit of a spent force all of the, all of those major institutions are so i think that yeah we are in you know we can all hope that things will get better i believe things will get better but they're going to get a lot worse before they get any better thank you so much thank you so much for answering my questions uh, okay ma'am so i think uh, we will wind up with two more questions we'll wind up with kunasekaran and priya so we'll finish with these two persons asking their yeah. questions so yeah uh, kunasekaran please unmute yourself and go ahead with your question yeah good evening sir hello am i audible sir good evening yeah uh sir uh, yeah your your discussion on the uh, agriculture and uh, farmers issue is uh, i greatly agree with you and uh, my question is uh, on the inequality side uh in the inequality side uh, uh, because of uh, that means uh, education policy uh, that means uh, there is a huge difference that means uh, uh, comes uh, when you talk about uh, government school education or private school education the government school education uh, contributes uh, major to the uh, sectors that means especially uh, people uh, those who are from the underprivileged community they come to the government schools and uh, they don't get a proper education and also right. deviates correct and and uh, on the other side if you see all the privileged communities go to the private schools and get a proper education and then they uh, keep moving ahead so how do you uh, think on this uh, aspect uh, to overcome the inequality yeah. goodness by... i totally you and i are in total agreement on this problem okay uh, number one let me let me take your so right about who goes to the government schools hmm? and i also yes. want to link it up to the apmc debate hmm? yes sir yeah uh, the gov if you know as a reporter when i am wanting to talk to students of different sections oh yes and i when if i want to talk to dalit students and adivasi students where do i go i go to the government school right yes sir yes sir yes um if i want to talk to upper caste and southern children where do i go i go to the private schools by the way you'll see that there are government schools budget schools every sector of indian society functions functions on the varna system okay yes sir yes sir yes even even government employment function class 1 class 2 class 3 class 4 employees who are the class 4 employees going to check them yeah yes sir i do agree sir largely dalits and adivasi at the bottom bottom of the employment cycle 
government schools now are bad because you are one of the lowest spenders on education in the world government hospitals are bad because you spend 1.28% of your thing on of your expenditures on health whereas say the united states is what 23% of some obscene figure and you are the lowest spender on health among the hmm. and here's the point now yet that government school you and i know that there are one or two states where it functions right oh yes sir government schools are better in say tamil nadu and kerala than they are in up and bihar now the point is this also again in societies where there is relatively greater egalitarianism the government schools will function better because there is more expenditure on education of state subject all of that happens on one but also know this the way we are saying shut down apmc is give people a choice should we shut down government schools mm. we can't no because tens of millions of indian children those wretched schools are the only chance they have of anything approaching an education am i right yeah yes sir yes, second sir. it is the only place where tens of millions of indian children get their best meal of the day my right yes sir one meal they get huh? so i'm saying this our aim should be to increase our education spending when i spoke about solutions at the close of my talk i said directive principles of state policy it would become the duty of the state it is the duty of the state to improve those schools not cut them down it is the duty of the state to raise expenditure on education to minimum 6.5% of expenditure it is the duty of the state and some state told you that government schools can function very well okay you got grants in aid you got private schools you got elite private schools you got that varna system let me put it this way and i hope uh, my other friends are listening the government schools are the apmcs of the education sector the phcs of district hospitals are the apmcs of the health sector what is being attacked is public ownership what is being attacked is public is public uh, access so that you are forced to go to the corporate sector forced to go to the private sector it is the right of every indian child that their children get free and education to the secondary level of a quality on par anywhere else by the way when it comes to government institutions which serve the rich we have quality is it not what about the indian institutes of technology what about the indian institutes of management what about the government medical colleges they have far higher quality than any private institutions agreed because yes, they are serving yeah. the children of the rich as well because they are serving the children of the rich they will be given quality if you can get that quality why can't you do it for the children of the poor it is their right it is their constitutional right so we need to massively expand our expenditure we need, in, at the time of independence there was a gandhian commission which said expenditure on education should never fall below 10% of your plan we never never after the first plan when it was averaging 9 9 something like 7.9% after that it's fallen to almost nothing the, i mean the facts are pretty simple the political question of whether we are willing to act on it that is a different matter yeah and the last question from sir 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 i just have a in addition to this uh, suppose if you have a uniform education system suppose if you break up uh, this uh, government policy government schools and uh, private schools and if you unite together so what would be the scenario what you what are you thinking there are, this? There are various things to do which the rti rte right to education tried in a very very 
unsatisfactory and rudimentary way and failed see there are there are things of neighborhood schooling where everybody goes to the same school you know the joke in the villages they always tell me when i'm reporting what when i if i ask what can you do to improve the village school they say dm son should also go to the school sir then the school will improve mm -hmm. right yes sir yes, district sir. magistrate like see when when the children of the rich go to iits and iims and medical colleges those improve dramatically huh? yes yes They're, they're, okay so i'm saying that egalitarianism of everybody goes to this school everybody goes to a particular school sri lanka had no private schools for 60 years of its 50 years of its existence and it is a more literate and educated society at the mass level okay sir yeah Priya, so i think we have that question no uh, i think yeah we'll stop it one second priya so please yeah. repeat the question yeah <laughs> thank you koshit uh, am i audible yeah you are audible please go on so thank you sir for this wonderful lecture and the way you are addressing uh, the question so i just have one po point on which i would request you to comment on so uh, i just wanted to know the existing insurance framework the crop insurance framework which which are largely being dominated by monopoly such as reliance so how does that affect the farmer on in in, in the in the ground scenario so i just uh, want to know the mechanics very quickly it devastates the farmer you can look at a powerpoint presentation i made on that for the government of andhra pradesh to ask them not to accept that scheme the pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana it's a very peculiar scheme um, built on what is called area and group uh, um, what indemnity area and group uh, insurance yeah it is dead against the farmer and a very simple figure will tell you everything in the first two years of the fasal bima yojana yeah in the first two years uh or was it even the first year it the 13 18 corporations out of which three or four were government sector who lost money because they were given the poorer sections to deal with 18 companies made profits yeah the total amount given to the insurance scheme was 20000 crores in one year 21000 crores in second year on that 40000 crores 84% of claims were never resolved and 18 companies made profits of 15,795 crores. They made some, the time period in which that profit is made is like say 21 crores every 24 hours. Hmm? But claims unresolved was something above 80%. So I think that should tell you everything about how the Fasal Bhima Yojana works. It works very well for corporations. For farmers, it doesn't work. and there have been riot situations and agitations on this issue in different states maharashtra rajasthan elsewhere yeah thank you thank you sir